Well, we still have a few people making their way in. Uh, it's one of the uh, most difficult task as a teacher when the class falls right after lunch. So keeping everybody in tune and away. But um, I just want to speak, just say thank you uh, for your participation, your attention, your partic- uh, basically being here, your attendance this quarter. Um, it's kind of weird how it kind of fell, but last year, last fall in 2022 is when Gunner and I started the Book of Acts, and it took a year basically to get through it. But we weren't we weren't teaching that could, that whole time, so it's a it's a blessing that we were able to kind of complete that last week. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the goal for kind of today is to finish out the quarter is to kind of hit some of the highlights, to hit some of the uh, more uh, meaty sections, some of the things that hopefully we can go back and and relate to and learn from from the book. Uh, we won't have time to hit everything, uh, as like I said, it took basically a year to get through it. But yet, um, hopefully, you've you can you've learned to grow and appreciate the book um, even more as we've gone through the study, and you've learned to be able you know, to take some of those things and apply them uh, in your studies and give you a little more better background. So next week, we'll see, we'll begin a new quarter. I know that. Uh, in the old library or room six, which is behind us, uh, Sam will be teaching on Galatians, the book of Galatians. And then in here, I know it'll be Carrie and John, but I'm not sure about their topic. Uh, it's going to be on church growth and spiritual maturity. Okay, church growth and spiritual maturity. Okay, so great. So uh, again, next week, so uh, make sure you... Uh, Choose which class you want to be a part of and be prepared to be here next week. Again, it's been a a great opportunity, a great honor to be able to be able to study and to help kind of lead through the class. Before we actually dive in, we'll actually begin with a word of prayer as he please bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for everything you bless us with in our lives. Father, we are so thankful for your son and his sacrifice on the cross. Father, we thank you for the, the hope that we have through that sacrifice, through his death and burial and resurrection. Father, we are so thankful for your love for us and that we have the opportunity to, to be obedient to you, to be faithful children of yours, And Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to to study your word this quarter. We thank you for the book of Acts, for so many applications, so so much information that's found in it, that you'd help each and every one of us to continue to study not only this, but your word that may may continue to grow in it, and may get closer to you by our study. Father, we thank you so much for the church here and throughout the world. Father, help to you to bless each individual member and help to you to help them again grow uh, closer to you. Father, we thank you so much for those who may be listening to us or watching online, that you'd help bless them even when they can't be with us, that you'd help bless them, whether it be uh, illness or maybe they're traveling, you'd help bless them that they may be, uh, be able to be back with us soon. Father, we thank you again so much for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I went back and and, uh, trying to figure out, you know, best avenue to kind of go through this. I'm going to kind of give you a a brief overview of just kind of going through the book. We're going to see some lessons from the book of Acts. We're going to see um, some basic items, and we're going to focus on... Some of the lessons that we can learn from Paul, hopefully in our study, not only you've had a better appreciation of the book of Acts, but also of the apostle Paul. And so uh, through that, we'll kind of dive in and, and see, and I'll have some questions as they go along. So looking at the book of Acts, we, we remember, if, uh, if 
as we've talked about several times, this the involvement. We could call Acts, you know, Book of Acts of the Apostles, but it's only of Acts of a, of a few of the mentioned apostles. We see uh, basically mentioned. We see James, John, Peter, and Paul actually mentioned in the book, uh, primarily given between Peter and Paul as far as most of the evangelistic work that took place. Um, history, the book is a book of history and a book of beginnings. We can see that as, as, we, as we've studied. We see the beginnings of the church or the kingdom. Um, for Christianity, for New Testament Christianity, it is a critical book of our understanding. It, it's, uh, as we'll get to a little later in the class, uh, it's referred to as, some, as the, the hub of the Bible. And so there's a lot that comes out of the book of Acts that we need to be, make sure that we're familiar with. There's a lot of examples, again, a lot of history there. Um, as far as time covered in the book, again, I mentioned a book of history, mentioned as a book of uh, beginnings, but yet it covers a span of around 30 years, uh, plus or minus a little bit, uh, basically from the ascension of Christ to Paul's imprisonment in Rome. So if you remember last week, uh, chapter 28, um, when Gunnar was talking about that, basically the, the book leaves off with Paul basically with some freedom there uh, in the Rome area. And so, again, just as far as some history, it's interesting, and we'll talk about this here shortly, but basically at the end of the book there's no mention, nothing uh, basically given as far as Paul's future at, at the end of Acts. So just kind of an interesting tidbit there. Um, as far as some of the Roman emperors, if you're into history, because some of the, some of the writings that based on history and things that we encountered um, would have had to do some of the history of those that were in power. And so the Roman emperors who reigned during this period were as follows. So we have uh, Tiberius, uh, which would have been basically 14 to 37 A.D. Uh, Caligula, which is basically 37 to 41. And if you're writing notes, if you want some of these notes, just feel free to let me know. I'll be happy to, to send them to you. Uh, Claudius, uh, which was 41 through 54 A.D. And then Nero, 54 through 68 A.D. So, again... Uh, and each of those had different emphasis, different actions and things that impacted, um, of course, Paul and others in the church. We look at the writer. We've talked about this several times. But who was the writer that we believe to be the writer of Acts? Luke, right. We, as we've talked about through uh, the similar styles, we look at even the first few verses of, chapter, of Acts chapter 1, the similar writings, the similar styles, also in... Um, in the travels and things that we went, we see a lot of the, the pronouns saying, you know, we traveled here, we went here. And so Luke, a lot of times, did go along or was present with Paul in some of the places that he went. So it, is just, it, you know, it just, again, gives us a little more background there in a, with the writing of Luke and also with Acts. Just some key verses. If you were in the class last year, again, a year ago, um, if, you, if I was going to pick one verse that would, you know, it's hard to pick one verse and, out of any book that gives kind of a summary or a thesis of the book. But if, you, if I was going to give one verse, I would pick chapter 1, verse 8. And what that says is, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This was back talking to the apostles, um, leading into chapter 2, when uh, the beginning of the church, of Peter's sermon, what would take place. But then as we've studied throughout the book of Acts, we see that, that fruition of what took place, that through their teaching, we would see that the church... Would be, they would be witnesses, both they'd be teaching Jerusalem, then you see a move to Judea, to Samaria, because of the spreading, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. We see some of that take place even with Paul's travels. And so we'll, we'll talk about that a little more, but you can see kind of just from that verse how Acts kind of follows through, and you see the spreading 
of the New Testament church and the gospel uh, to others. So it's, it's a great, great thought. Just a brief, uh, brief outline. I mentioned I had a real detailed outline. I'm not going to sit there and give all that, but if you're writing something down and you want just a brief outline of the book of Acts, I have uh, kind of one I'll just mention uh, just as a kind of a review. So chapters 1 through 7, you'll see the church uh, established in Jerusalem. I'm sorry, yeah, chap- chapter 1, it goes through, yeah, okay. Uh, church, chapters, and it kind of overlaps. Chapters 3 through 7, the church grew in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12, the church was scattered to Judea and Samaria, as we just talked about in chapter 1, verse 8. We saw that those cities were named exclusively. Chapters 10 10 through 12, we see an overlap there. The church expanded, uh, I want to say, to different groups, to uh, include the Gentiles. Um, Some some people say... uh, you know, some people the words expanded racially. I don't really like to say that, but yet it went to, it included the Gentiles and the Jews. And so that was, that was a very key portion, very key item that took place. Um, chapters 13 through 28, this is a very big overview, but the church spread to the uttermost, uttermost parts. And so you have, like I said, just a very basic outline if, you could definitely expand on that uh, through your studies. Um, just as a just a note, if you want to sit there and note the, the three different journeys that Paul went on, just if you ever want to go back and study those or study the locations, I know I'd provided a map um, a couple weeks ago just of the last couple chapters, but yet uh, if you sit there and sometimes you can look at the back of your Bible at a map, but it's really a great geography lesson. It's also, as far as biblical geography, it's also helpful to understand the distance that were travels, that, that were in, encompassed in the travels that Paul and others went on when you study all, the, the, basically, the trips that he went through. Um, basically, the first uh, journey takes place from chapter uh, 3, verse 4, through chapter 14, verse 28. Um, the second one is uh, chapter 15, verse 36, through chapter 18, verse 22. And then the third was chapter 18, verse 23, through chapter 21, verse 14. So if you want, again, to note those or go back and look at those, that's, that's a great opportunity there. Um, when we look at think about Paul, we think about timelines, we think about um, Paul being inspired writer. And what's Paul, what's one of the, I guess, the things we note, we note Paul being as far as one of the inspired writers? I guess I should ask the question differently, but basically we see that he's probably one of the most, uh, one of the ones that kept, covered the most epistles. Uh, he's known for at least basically 13 uh, inspired writings to either uh, basically individual congregations or in the case of individuals such as Timothy and Titus and others there. But we see them, they kind of fall into four groups and you can kind of see throughout the book of Acts, we didn't take time to discuss this, but yet we see kind of how they fall into place within the timeline. So Paul was, if you sit there and think about Paul being so busy, in all his teachings, in all his, uh, his defense of himself, his uh, imprisonment, everything that Paul went through, if you, if you take that and include on top of that, that he was busy in uh, teaching others, communicating, writing, uh, it's just you sit there and you have a greater appreciation for the things that he accomplished. Um, basically, if you sit there from the, from the second missionary journey, which was... Uh, basically timeline between 52 and 53 AD, we see uh, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians was written from Corinth. From the 3rd missionary journey, which was basically between 57 and 58 AD, we see uh, the book of Galatians 
which was written from Ephesus. We see 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Um, we also see Romans written from the first, or, or basically the first or the early Roman imprisonment, from 62 to 63 AD. We see the books of Colossians, then Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians written. And then towards the end, around 67 AD, we see uh, 1 Timothy, uh, Titus, and then 2 Timothy written from Rome. So, um, like I said, very, very uh, busy, very engaged. Um, and you can kind of, when you have a better understanding of how things fell as far as timeline, you can appreciate uh, when those things took place. I know one of the things that uh, we had a, a men's Bible study in the, the last uh, books that we had studied. We had studied Philippians, and the last things we had studied were, was through First and Second Timothy. And when you think about that being towards the end of Paul's writing, towards the end of Paul's life, it can give you a greater appreciation for what he had gone through, also his instructions, his, um, his history, and the things that he had learned along the way, those things that he could pass on to a young minister like Timothy. So hopefully these things are, are beneficial. Hopefully these things are, help you appreciate when you go through and you study that it'll help you understand um, a little more of the background. As you think about uh, Paul, I want to pull out a little more information, just thinking about uh, Paul. Paul was not one to uh, have a big head, uh, very egotistical, as we would think someone who could easily sit there and say, well, I, I did this, I did this, I did this. Um, Paul was more uh, probably as far as humility, as far as uh, humbleness, as far as that demeanor, uh, that, as we can read and, and we, we can see in other, some of his writings that we could come across with any. But yet it's, it's one that's interesting uh, when we think about the Apostle Paul Think about the things he went through, the things he did previously as Saul. Uh, he had a lot probably on his mind that he was indebted to, it seems like. So uh, just things to think about. The Apostle Paul said he labored more than they all. He was one that, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 11, uh, we can see, he, as far as a comparison, we might consider him to be the greatest worker, both as a missionary and as a writer, with the exception of uh, Christ. But mostly the best, the greatest worker as a missionary and writer. Remember his background, all the background that Paul had? We, we know that uh, his background, his, his upbringing, definitely would help him through... Um, through the imprisonment and stuff later in Acts. But his background, a Hebrew, a Pharisee, a native of Tarsus in Cilicia. He was born a Roman citizen, as I just mentioned. He was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, if you let, sit there and compare him with all the other apostles, uh, Paul would probably most likely be the most educated of all of them. Um, on, in, in, in Scripture. Now you can sit there and you could say, that Luke was a physician, um, you know, as far as that, but yet, um, as far as apostles, you could sit there and think, as far as biblical, he had a lot of background in, in Jewish customs, and also he had dedicated his life to learning and teaching. It's interesting, when we first meet Paul, we sit there and think about comparisons, and first meet Paul as Saul, um, when he was, he was actually about the same age of Jesus around the beginning of the church and the murder of Stephen. So just as far as thinking about that uh, early, uh, you know, time frame there. But think about if you give a, a timeline, if you think uh, throughout the book of Acts, you know, from eighty, you know, thirty ish, thirty three plus, into the sixties or sixty eight, sixty nine A.D. Um, Paul was, you know, in his probably the 60s in that time frame. And so he, he was very busy. He was very active in, in his life. Um, when we think about also the comparison, as I just mentioned a while ago, his, before his conversion, 
Saul of Tarsus, he was the foremost persecutor of the church. We've, we've talked about that. We've, we've studied about that. You can sit there and see, if you look back, you look at the fear after the church began, one of the largest um, things that they were afraid of, of course, was punishment, persecution, and death. And he was a foremost persecutor, well-known persecutor of the church at that time. So it's interesting, I know we've talked about it a lot of times, but yet if you think about him, foremost persecutor of the church, then afterward as Paul the Apostle, he was the most persecuted disciple in the New Testament. So interesting how he would sit there and take that. And, and I mean, we know he utilized that, but it was just an interesting comparison. If you sit there and look at, uh, we think about the different journeys he completed. We sit there and think about um, all the imprisonment. We look at, at the end of Paul's life because a lot of times like it's not given to us. But according to tradition, Paul was released from prison, had a period of freedom, basically from this, one of the writers says 63 to 67 AD, was arrested again and sent to Rome a second time. His death basically was recorded or was rumored to have been he was beheaded for Christ by the order of Nero in the spring of 68 AD. That's kind of what the tradition or what, according to, Tradition, what it says as far as the end of Paul. Um, we could definitely see that he lived a life dedicated to proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming and living it for God. And so, uh, definitely a faithful minister, a faithful apostle of Christ. <clears throat> I came across one interesting uh, summation. If you look at, if you wanted just a core uh, explanation of a summer, uh, basically a summary of Paul's life. There, I came across this one who was written by a former a minister of the church named Frank Dunn. It said, Paul was fully committed to Christ, but with one aim to please God, and with one goal, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. His unworldliness was uh, more complete, his love of souls more universal, his joyfulness more spiritual, and his temper more heavenly than any religious leader who ever lived, except for Christ himself. We think about all that. We think about Paul being the, the uh, you know, maybe best educated in his background and in, even in the word. Paul even describes himself as being untrained or being rude or untrained in speech. He might have had the best words to say. He, he mentioned this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6. But basically, he considers himself, he might not be able to say the right things. He might not be able to have the best uh, way to speech, speak to others or be able to capture everybody's attention. But he said he was rude in speech or untrained in speech, but not in knowledge. He, was, he considered himself to be uh, knowledgeable, to be firm in the faith, uh, to be anchored in Christ. And so... A lot of times we might sit there and even think about this for our, our own learning. How many of us, you know, as far as, um, and I can throw myself in this mix too, just that last point. Um, how many of us, you know, we've taught classes before and we get to a point where whether we're burned out or maybe uh, it's been a while since we've taught. Or sometimes we sit there and think, or might use this use, you know, I just don't know if I can get up in front of people and, and say something or or present something, that's okay. But yet, even Paul himself considered himself maybe not to be able to say the right things or to be, wasn't trained to be able to get up and speak in front of others, but yet he still did. But he had a, a background, he had a foundation and a knowledge, and that's what helped him be successful, of course, in his faithfulness to God. The, um, we look at, the different um, lessons that are taught throughout the book of Acts. And again, you don't have to write these down, but yet if you want to sit there and have a study of the different lessons or different um, things that are taught throughout the Acts, 
Um, this will give you a good background, a good thing to go and study. And you might be able to even use these uh, in developing a lesson for other things. But uh, we see the first one, uh, Peter on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, uh, 14 through 39. Um, the next, just going kind of with the book, uh, Peter on Solomon's porch, chapter 3, verses 12 through 26. We see Peter, uh, basically before the Sanhedrin in chapter 4, 8 through 12. We see uh, Stephen's defense in chapter 7. We'll, if we have time, we'll touch on this in just a few minutes. Chapter 5, or sorry, number 5, Paul, or Peter's sermon to Cornelius' household. And basically the landmark kind of a chapter thing that said basically the first sermon to the Gentiles, which was chapter 10, 35 through 43. <coughs> Excuse me. Peter's defense before the Jerusalem church for the conversion of Cornelius. We see this in chapter 11, 5 through 18. Paul at Antioch. We see chapter 13, 17 through 41. Paul at Athens, chapter 17. Uh, Paul to the Ephesian elders, chapter 20. So you have, like I said, you have, there's still more uh, Paul's defense in the temple, chapter 22. Paul before Felix, that gets a little more familiar because we've studied that in the last few weeks. Uh, Paul before Festus and before Agrippa, chapter 26 and, and following. And then last week, as, as Gunnar was finishing up the last part of chapter 28, we see even Paul... After the shipwreck, after um, finally getting to Rome, um, him sitting there and taking the opportunity to teach and talk to the Jews at Rome, which was chapter 28, verses 23 through 28. So one thing I, I just, uh, in my studies, and I hope, uh, hope you all can kind of see this too, and it, when you sit there and you go through and you talk about the book of Acts, and you see all the different examples, and you see all the different sermons and all the different discourses and all the lessons that we can learn, I uh, hope it gives you a greater appreciation of everything that took place. And we can see the benefit that we'll talk about uh, here just shortly that took place because of that kind of a cause and effect. You know, there, you sit there and you have something that, that impacts something and then you have a benefit or an effect from that. For those, um, we talked about beginnings, we talked about the beginning of the church, we talked about history in Acts. Um, nine different examples of conversion in the book of Acts. So, again, if you're trying to teach somebody the gospel, if you're trying to um, give them examples of conversion, there's some, some really beneficial ones in the book of Acts to go to. Um, I'll just read these through real quick, but you know, definitely Acts chapter 2, the Jews on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, Ethiopian eunuch, chapter 8, uh, definitely the conversion of Saul in chapter 9, um, Cornelius chapter 10, Lydia, if y'all remember that one in Acts chapter 16, we see also the Philippian jailer, chapter 16, uh, the Corinthians in chapter 18, and Ephesians in chapter 19. So again, um, interesting information, a lot of background, and I'm hoping that this is helpful, beneficial, uh, to give you just a, a greater background, even though we're doing this kind of a post-study, just thinking back and hopefully this kind of sounds familiar to some of the things that we discussed. Um, we think, sit there and think about some of the uh, verses that stick out. I know we, I brought out uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Maybe, maybe I would consider that being a, a thesis or at least a, a good go-to as far as explaining the book. Um, you might say in chapter 2 there's a lot of information there as far as uh, go-to verses, and we'll talk about that shortly. But one of the things um, as far as just... Uh, an overview, some of the things that took place. One of the things is, as far as the name Christian, we think about Acts chapter 11, verse 26, they were first called Christians at Antioch. So just 
as far as the name, as far as uh, wearing the name of Christ. Um, Acts 11.26 gives you a little background for that. The interesting thing, and I, I'm not going to take the time to, to spend on it, but um, I had eight different comparisons in, in the book of Acts. Uh, or maybe I will take the time to do it, but yet uh, where Paul and Peter basically in different parts of the book are engaged in a lot of the same situations. It is a very interesting comparison. So Peter, first sermon uh, in Acts, Acts chapter 2. Of course, we're familiar with that. Paul's first sermon, Acts chapter 13. Back to Peter, uh, lame person healed, chapter 3. Paul, we see a lame person healed in chapter 14, verse 8. Um, Simon uh, the sorcerer, Peter addressed Simon the sorcerer in chapter 8. Paul had to address uh, Elymas the sorcerer in chapter 13. Um, the, basically, you know, laying on of hands, chapter 8. Uh, the laying on of hands by Paul, chapter 19. Uh, again, like I said, a lot of these took place. We see uh, Peter in prison in chapter 12. We see Paul imprisoned multiple times, but also especially in chapter 28 uh, listed there. But just the comparison there is interesting. Uh, it be an interesting study just on your own to take the time and, and look at the life of Peter and the life of Paul. Again, both of them were very active, very key roles in the book of Acts. And uh, both had a very huge impact there. The one thing that we remember, uh, even with Paul's background, uh, yeah, Paul was there. He was, a, he was chosen, uh, chosen vessel of God. And you know, his was teach, but also to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so just inter interesting thing there. When I went, go back and we think about the a few minutes ago, I talked about the conversion accounts, the things that took place in the book of Acts, the history, the emphasis of um, Acts 2 and the teaching and uh, the emphasis that took place there. Um, one of the things I've always enjoyed going back to look at, and I, I don't have time to sit there and take and give you book, chapter, verse on each one, but think about... Um, the results of the sermons or results of the accounts that took place um, throughout the book of Acts and as far as the church beginning and the church growth. So Acts 2, we see the record of growth of around 3,000 souls in verse 41. Acts 4, verse 4, number of men totaled about 5,000. So you see the church continuing to grow. Acts chapter 5, 14, the believers increasingly grew, were added. We see multitudes taking place. Acts 6, verse 7, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. You see, you see this growth continuing to happen. Um, Acts 9, 31, the churches were multiplied. Acts 12, 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts 16, 5, the churches increased in number daily. And then Acts 19, 20, the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. So you can see the emphasis that was placed on teaching, the emphasis that was placed on uh, evangelism. I guess you could use that, that key term because if you see uh, basically the Great Commission taking place, not only locally, but especially with Paul and Peter and others that followed along with them, and you see the impact, you see the effect of that. And that should be a lesson for us today. And I speak just as much to me, if not more me than anybody else, that's saying, you know, the lessons that we've learned from Acts, the lessons that we've learned from Paul and Peter, uh, they should be something we apply to ourselves. Uh, there are people who need to hear the gospel. There are our neighbors, our fr friends, our family, our coworkers, uh, those in Jamaica, those overseas, different, different places. And yes, there's people that we support that are active in doing that, but there's, there's roles that we can play in that. There's, there's things we can do to help make that happen. And so hopefully um, a lot of the study 
a lot of the emphasis, a lot of the things that we've learned, hopefully some of the application you could take from Peter and Paul and those in Acts, uh, hopefully will help encourage you, influence you to be more active in, in that. The, um, I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about just some of the key things taking place in the book. The, as I mentioned, you know, one of the people had described, uh, one of the commentators had referred to Acts chapter 2 as the hub of the Bible. I'm just going to read these. There's, there's too many to, to make note of unless you're really quick in, in writing. But I want to read through these and you can have maybe a greater appreciation. Maybe it says it better than what I can say it. These are all things that took place basically within Acts chapter 2. We see it's a record of many great spiritual events. The coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, the only instance of Holy Spirit baptism. Mm -hmm. The fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies concerning the outpouring of the Spirit, the coming of the day of salvation, the proclamation of the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, and the beginning of Christ's reign upon the throne of David. The gospel first preached in, name, in the name of the resurrected Christ. The question of what to, do, what to do to be saved was first answered by inspired men. The gift of the Holy Spirit was first promised to those being saved. Penitent believers were for, were for the first time baptized into the name of Christ. The great commission of Christ was first executed. The new law, the word of the Lord, went forth from Jerusalem. For the first time, the Lord added those who were being saved to his church, Acts 2.47. Basically, the church was in existence. Uh, it began. The church... Uh, this was the beginning of the church, the Lord's establishment of the church or kingdom, which he said would come with power, Mark 9, 1. It was the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to build his church upon the foundation of himself as the Christ, the Son of the living God. For the first time, Peter used the keys of the kingdom in giving the terms of entrance into the church or kingdom in the name and by the authority of Christ. It was the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise of salvation to the Jews and Gentiles. It marked the beginning of the Christian dispensation in the last age of the world in relationship to the patriarchal age and Jewish age that preceded it. The items of Christian worship except for singing are given for the first time. And Peter uh, later referred to the events of Acts 2 as the beginning. This is the first instance of the great salvation being confirmed by the miraculous acts of the apostles in Acts 2, Mark 16, and Hebrews 2. This was the beginning of the apostles bearing witness to the resurrection of Christ and to his being the Savior of all men. The terms of salvation given in Acts 2 are the same as those given by Christ in the Great Commission. And in every other case of conversion in the book of Acts, as well as all other related scriptures. The message of salvation proclaimed in Acts 2 was the word of the truth of the gospel and the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes um, and is obedient to it. The gospel that was preached on Pentecost cannot be changed and God holds all men accountable to obedience of its terms and salvation. From the time of Acts 2 forward, the church or the kingdom of Christ is always referred to in the New Testament as being in existence. And again, as I mentioned, we see the answer, we see the, the phrase, what must I do to be saved? We see that being answered. One final thing just before we finish up. If you are, everybody would flip, take to, uh, flip to Philippians chapter 1. I know I've talked about some, just some characteristics of Paul, but I think we can have a little greater appreciation as we read through some of the inspired writings. Philippians chapter 1, remember starting verse 12, and this is of course addressing the, the church there in Philippi, but uh, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. 
And most of the brethren of the Lord have become confident by my chains and much more bold to speak the word without fear. We see that we see this, the, again, things that took place, things that Paul went through uh, benefiting the church, benefiting the word of God that it spread continually. Um, we're finishing up. If you sit there and um, move down to verse 19, I'm having to skip a little bit, but verse 19 to chapter 1. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit in Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress of the joy of faith. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Christ Jesus by my coming to you again. And then he goes on and, and gives more in, instruction and encouragement. And I wanted to finish the class, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> Just a reminder uh, of Paul um, and it's something for us that we can be mindful of too. Something I just want to finish the class on. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 7 and 8, thinking about Paul's life, thinking about uh, towards the end of Acts, thinking this is one, you know, probably one of the last writings that Paul had <clears throat> uh, given instruction to the minister Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, Again, thinking about just the appreciation, the dedication, uh, the zeal that Paul had um, throughout this. Uh, like I said, we, I didn't have time to go through and even, even hit on Peter much at all. But yet, just I hope it gives us a greater, greater appreciation of the whole book of Acts. The, that when the church began in Acts 2 and where we are to today, things have taken place. But yet, a lot of times, like I said, as Paul uh, struggled, as Paul had um, trials, as Paul had imprisonment, the things, the faith that he had uh, didn't die there. The church didn't die there. It continued to grow because of his example. The early church continued. If you look at Acts chapter 2 and following, as we mentioned, the church, even though it was scattered, the church continued to grow because it was scattered into other areas. And so our faithfulness, when we sit there and think about books like Acts and others that, uh, that Paul, the inspired writer, wrote and others, it can help hopefully us develop a better faith, a greater faith, because of our study and because of the examples that we have. Any final comments or questions? I know I kind of gave a really big overview, but I wanted to kind of sit, hit some of the highlights and give you a little better appreciation for the book. So, all right. Thank you all very much.